Hey, I'm Bex, and this is Fun Kids Meet, the podcast where we meet your heroes. Recently, I caught up with Rianne Tracy and found out about an amazing new book, I Spy, a Bletchley Park Mystery. How are you doing? Really well, thank you. Thanks for having me on. I'm really excited to have you on, Fun Kids, um, because your book is, uh, it's very readable, Rianne. It's very, oh my goodness, it was really, really like, I just wanted to get to the end of it to find out what was happening. Um, <laughs> but before we get into that, we've got, uh, we've got to tell our listeners it's set in a place called Bletchley Park. Can you tell us, if we don't know what it is, what Bletchley Park is and was? Absolutely. So Bletchley Park was one of the most secret places in Britain during the war. Um, Originally, it was a mansion owned by a family. And then um, it was bought as a place to conduct covert operations such as code breaking. Um, And very famous people ended up working there, very clever people, lots and lots of women who were recruited um, from all over Britain and eventually um, the team there cracked a code, the Enigma code, which is believed to have shortened World War II by two years. So such an important place uh, for World War II. Absolutely. And uh, in your story, we meet Robin, who lives basically in, in Bletchley in the area, right? Yes. So when I was doing my research, I um, came across the fact that there was a child living on site in Bletchley Park, which was really unusual. Um, it was a, a place peopled by adults. But the um, the original chauffeur who lived there had four children. And when Bletchley Park was taken over um, for war work, the, the children weren't allowed off site. They had to stay on Bletchley Park because the adults didn't feel that they could trust the children to, to go to school um, and were worried that they would blab. So this gave me a great idea about building a whole story around a child at Bletchley rather than the adults. And pretty early on in the story, this isn't really a spoiler, uh, Robin, our our character, has to sign a kind of official secrets act, which is quite a scary thing to do for a kid or for an adult even. Absolutely, yes. This was a terrifying document um, which everybody had to sign if they were working at Bletchley Park. And sometimes you had to sign it more than once um, if you went off to do something else and then came back. So um, my great aunt who worked at Bletchley Park during the war, she had to sign this um, document when she was only 17. And essentially, you were promising that you wouldn't speak about your war work, you wouldn't speak about what happened at Bletchley Park ever for the rest of your life. And if you did, you could possibly be sent to prison, you could be shot by a firing squad. Um, It was just so important that people didn't speak about it, um, that it was that serious, you know, it, it could cost you your life. So I'm guessing uh, if your great auntie worked there, you must have had inspiration from her, but also she probably kept a lot of secrets, so you didn't know a lot of stuff about it from her. Absolutely. We didn't know anything about it until um, she was out for Sunday lunch with uh, her daughter and her granddaughter and um, various other family members. And somebody was talking about Bletchley Park and uh, Audrey uh, stood up and announced that she had worked at Bletchley Park and that they'd got something wrong. Um, And it was the first anyone had heard of it. It was a real shock to the family. Wow. Um, And she had signed the Official Secrets Act. And even in the 70s, when um, people were allowed to start talking about it, a lot of women and men didn't. They, They really did take it very seriously. She didn't ever tell her husband about it. So he never knew. Um, And over the years, various small little secrets trickled out. So we got a, a clearer picture of what she did, um, which was uh, stripping Japanese codes. So, um, you know, unraveling the codes in Japanese and translating them into something understandable in English. Oh, man, it's an incredible thing. And so you must have had to do a lot of research then to get Robin's story factually correct. Absolutely. Yes. Years of research. Um, so probably started brimming in my head when my daughter was in year six and she's now in year 11. Um, I went as a a parent helper to Bletchley Park and was just (laughs) bombarded by ideas. I carried my notebook around whilst trying to head count various children, (laughs) make sure no one fell in the lake (laughs) Um, while I was inspired, which the kids thought was very funny. Um, So yes, I, I took my research really seriously and I was really lucky um, that Bletchley Park assisted me. They they were wonderful. The historical team there and the archivists um, helped me even during lockdown. They were still in contact with me, making sure that, you know, I was getting things right. And if I was 
kind of being creative around some of the the timelines that you know it would still all make sense um so yes i've had huge support from bletchley and um, and the arts council as well who gave me a grant to write the book which landed in my lap right at the start of lockdown so um yeah, it was a very strange time actually to be sort of cooped up in my house not allowed anywhere with my children um not knowing what on earth was going on in the world whilst writing about a girl cooped up at Bletchley Park, not allowed off site, not allowed outside, <laughs> yeah. not knowing what was going on in her world either. It was very bizarre timing. And so in the book, you've got Robin, you've got her friend uh, Mary, who's an evacuee from Liverpool, and you've got yes. her friend Ned. Uh, can you tell us a little bit? I mean, I know I don't want to ruin it for people, but a little bit about yeah. what they get up to in the book. What's the, what's the, what's the gist of it for them? Okay, so Robin's a nosy Parker and she is in this place where lots of interesting things are happening and she thinks that she's going to be on her own. But um, Mary, who's evacuated to Bletchley, has kind of um, got herself a job in Bletchley Park as a messenger girl, which really did happen. There were sort of 13, 14 year old girls on bicycles riding all around the park, delivering very important mail. So Mary has access to lots of different things, although she would never. Um, And then Ned is there because his father's the undertaker. So in order to build the huts for the ever-growing staff, most carpenters were off at war. So they, uh, at Bletchley, they asked undertakers to come in and help construct huts. And um, this is what Ned does. He comes in with his father and he, he helps build the huts. And obviously, three children notice they are the only children there. They gravitate towards each other. They become friends. And Mary and Robin were friends at school before. And Robin's met this very unpleasant man at uh, Bletchley who seems to think he runs the place and absolutely does not like children. Um, He would happily have them all escorted off site permanently. And she starts to sort of notice that he's up to things. He's being very covert and very sneaky. And the three children start taking an interest in what he's up to and uncover a whole world of double crossing and double agents and spies and codes and secrets that um, they really should have kept far, far away from because it's quite dangerous. Oh man, it's exactly what you want from a Bletchley Park mystery, isn't it? We have to mention the pigeons as well because uh, as you you know, I love pigeons. My uncle keeps them and races them. And I was thrilled to read that you focus so much on pigeons in the book as well. Did you have to research that too? Absolutely. So if you uh, go to Bletchley Park in one of the huts, there's a big room dedicated to pigeons and the role they played during World War II, but particularly the role they played locally and at Bletchley. Um, So I've always loved birds and animals. I find them really interesting. And I assumed that most people knew about pigeons uh, and their role during the war, but it turns out not that many people do anymore. So the pigeons were used as carrier pigeons um, so that they would be uh, taken by an agent, um, flown with the agent, dropped um, behind enemy lines to receive a message, and then they would fly back to their pigeon loft. Um, and so there was a pigeon loft at Bletchley, um, although there's not much known about the role uh, Bletchley and pigeons played during the war. But um, they did know that pigeons were taken to and came from um, Sandringham, which is one of the royal palaces and uh, the royal family. So our late queen, when she was a princess, uh, she and her sister, Margaret Rose, were very interested in pigeons and had their own pigeon loft, as did the then king, George VI. And um, the family were were very supportive of pigeons and their role during the war. Um, so yeah, they were vital. We we couldn't have done without them. See, I love that so much. I'll have to tell my uncle. He'll be thrilled to hear that pigeons are getting a renaissance. He'll be very, very happy yeah. about this. <laughs> now, before I let you go, we do a thing with every author on Fun Kids. It's like a quick fire round of questions, a kind of this or that. I wondered if we could play that with you right now, if that's all right. Absolutely. Okay, brilliant stuff. Okay, first up, books or Kindles? Oh, books. Always books. <laughs> Heroes or villains? <gasps> oh, you've got to have a good villain and I've got a great villain in I Spy. <laughs> Well, that's a good little plug. I like that. Uh, Film adaptation or TV adaptation? Ooh, TV, because I I have a low attention span, so sometimes films are too long. (laughs) Uh, Fair (laughs) enough. Pigeons or dogs? Oh, dogs. I've got to pick dogs. My my dog is my life. I love my dogs. (laughs) Beginnings or endings? Beginnings. Definitely beginnings, because that's what draws you in in the first place. Writing or teaching? Oh, that's a hard one. Well, my week is split, so I'm 50-50. Um, 
Oh, I, I can't choose. That's, I'll, I'll give you that one. That's all right. I'll let you off with that one. Um, <laughs> Hogwarts or Narnia? Hogwarts. I'm a, I'm a big Harry Potter fan. Laptop or write by hand? Write by hand, definitely. Although I did write a whole book by hand once and regretted it because obviously I had to type it up. Oh, yeah. But yeah, I love taking my notebook out and making notes. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, very few people say that. That's interesting. Mm. Cracking codes or making puzzles? Cracking codes. I'm so nosy. I love <laughs> cracking codes and understanding things and finding out secrets. <laughs> Paddington Bear or Winnie the Pooh? Paddington. Marmalade sandwiches. You just you can't not have those in your delicious. life. Finally, the big one, salt and vinegar or cheese and onion? Oh, salt and vinegar. Yes. And I have a, a hit list of the best salt and vinegar crisps. I have sampled them all. <laughs> McCoy's. McCoy's, although others are available. Are oh, my, my favourites. Goodness, you're my kind of author. Yeah, you know what? Salt and vinegar is... <laughs> I don't mind whatever you say for the rest of them, but salt and vinegar is the one I care about the most. Um, Absolutely. So you've passed my, my secret hidden test. Um, oh, thank goodness. Rian, thank you so much for telling us all about I Spy. And can we uh, expect maybe some other books in the series as well? Well, it does say on the cover, a Bletchley Park mystery, which suggests there are more mysteries to uncover. And I may be uncovering one right now. <laughs> Amazing. That was Rian Tracy. And I love talking to her all about I Spy, a Bletchley Park mystery. Of course, mostly because I love talking about pigeons. Uh, remember, if you've loved this podcast, you can listen to Bookworms and find out about even more brilliant authors. <laughs>